It's a pleasure to welcome Alan First back to Politics and Prose to discuss his new novel, Midnight in Europe, which I just learned is going to debut at number six on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> I'm going to be very brief so we can get right to it, but I'll just tell you that First has been called a master of the historical spy novel, and his latest combines a Parisian setting, a handsome Spaniard protagonist, an international white shoe law firm, arms traders, and Europe on the eve of war, which is to say another captivating thriller. Please help me welcome Alan First. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read. Is this working? Um, I'm going to read briefly, about 15 minutes, which I find is about the tolerable level for people. Um, I've seen people <laughs> do f think, oh, they love me, you know, I'll go 45 minutes. <laughs> and then after the 15 minutes, uh, we'll do Q&A. So think up some dreadful, brutal question. Um, this is Midnight in Europe. Um, it's not so easy to describe. Um, as we uh, got into pre-production at Random House, I came up with this three-word description of this book, which I really like, which goes, uh, Gangsters versus Fascists. And, 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 and it actually is that. That's, that's really how it works. It's a book uh, about arms dealing uh, on behalf of the Spanish Republic in 1938, um, hopelessly, and they knew it. Uh, and uh, it, that's a whole other story about the period that led up to World War II. I'll just tell you one anecdote that's characteristic of the period. Long about the... Uh, middle of 1938, the French decided that they had to rearm. It was a little bit late. Uh, they uh, came to New York and retained the Coudair Law Firm, which is very much a character in this book. And um, they said, we want to buy 5,000 airplanes, 5,000 fighter planes. There weren't 5,000 fighter planes to buy. And it's worth remembering that in that period of time, the companies, Boeing and the rest of them, who manufactured aircraft were owned and run by men um, who had built their first aircraft with their own hands. So it was a very, very early period. Okay, here we go. Um, I do have a, uh, an epigraph. Uh, Considering where I am tonight, I would say fully two-thirds of the people in this room know this epigraph, but the reason I used it was I always like reading it. No matter how many times I've seen it, it does something for me. And that is, uh, as spoken by Sir Edward Gray, the British Foreign Secretary, in August of 1914 on the eve of w the First World War, who said, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our time. The last three words being used by Hemingway as the uh, title of his book of short stories. The first uh, chapter is called The Paris Front, and this book begins at Saks Fifth Avenue. <laughs> I must say, which pleased the hell out of me when I came up with the idea. Hey, I'm human, you know. <laughs> On a soft winter evening in Manhattan, the 15th of December, 1937, it started to snow. Big flakes spun lazily in the sky, danced in the lights of the office buildings, then melted as they hit the pavement. At Saks Fifth Avenue, the window displays were lush and glittering, tinsel, toy trains, sugary frost dusted on the glass, and a crowd had gathered at the main entrance, drawn by a group of carolers dressed for a Dickens Christmas in long mufflers, top hats, and bonnets. Here then, for as long as it lasted, was a romantic New York, the New York in a song on the radio. Christian Ferrar, a Spanish emigre who lived in Paris, 
took a moment to enjoy the spectacle, then hurried across the avenue as the traffic light turned red and began to work his way through the crowd. In a buckled briefcase carried under his arm, he had that morning's New York Times. The international news was as usual. Marches, riots, assassinations, street brawls, arson, political warfare was tearing Europe apart. Real war was coming. This was merely the overture. In Spain, political warfare had flared into civil war, and the Times reported the Army of the Republic had attacked General Franco's fascist forces at the Aragonese town of Teruel. And you only had to turn the page, there was more. Hitler's Nazi Germany had issued new restrictions on the Jews, while here was a photograph of Benito Mussolini, shown by his personal rail car as he gave the stiff-armed fascist salute, and there a photograph of Marshal Stalin reviewing a parade of tank columns. Christian Farrar would force himself to read it, would ask himself, is there anything to be done? Is it hopeless? So it seemed. Elsewhere in the newspaper, the democratic opposition to the dictators tried not to show fear, but it was in their every word the nervous dithering of the losing side. As Franco and his generals attacked the elected republic, the others joined in, troops and warplanes provided by Germany and Italy, and with every victory they boasted and bragged and strutted, it's our turn, get out of our way, or else. He'd had a long, long day. A lawyer with the Couder Frere law firm in Paris, he'd spent hours at the Couder home office at 2 Rector Street. There had been files to read, meetings to attend, and confidential discussions with the partners as they worked on matters that involved both the Paris and the New York offices, whose wealthy clientele had worldwide business interests and, sometimes, eccentric lives. Couder had, early in the century, famously untangled the Byzantine affairs of the son of Jacques Lebaudie. Lebaudie père had earned millions of dollars, becoming known as the sugar king of France. But the son was another story. On receipt of his father's fortune, he'd gone thoroughly mad and led a private army to North Africa and there declared himself Emperor of the Sahara. In time, the French Foreign Legion had sent the emperor packing and he'd wound up living on Long Island where his wife shot and killed him. <laughs> but the difficulties of the Le Baudy case were minor compared to what Couder had faced that day, the legal hell created by the Spanish Civil War, now in its 17th month. Individuals and corporations cut off from their money, families in hiding because they were trapped on the wrong side, whatever side that was, burnt homes, burnt factories, burnt records, with no means of proving anything to insurance companies or banks or government bureaucracies. The Couder lawyers in Paris and New York did the best they could, but sometimes there was little to be done. We regret your misfortune, monsieur, but the oil tanker has apparently vanished. Farrar had left the Couder office at 5.30 and headed uptown to his hotel, the Gotham. Then, as a favor to a friend at the Spanish embassy in Paris, he'd walked over to the Spanish Republic's arms-buying office at 515 Madison Avenue. Here he'd picked up two manila envelopes he would take back to Paris. The days when you could trust the mail were long gone. He went next to Saks, meaning to buy Christmas presents, a hammered silver bracelet and a cashmere sweater for a woman friend he was to meet at seven. This love affair had gone on for more than two years as every three months or so he flew to Lisbon where one could take the Pan Am flying boat to New York. Actually, Farrar was not precisely a Spaniard. He'd been born in Barcelona and so thought of himself as Catalan from Catalonia, in ancient times a principality that included the French province of Roussillon. A Castilian from Madrid might well have recognized Farrar's origin, his skin at the pale edge of dark, a gentle hawkish slope to the nose, and the deep green eyes common to the Catalan with thick black hair combed straight back from a high forehead and cut in the European style, noticeably long and low on the neck. 
In June, he'd turned 40, rode horseback in the Bois de Bologna twice a week, and stayed lean and tight with just that exercise. Heading toward the entrance to Saxe, he wore a kind of lawyer's battle dress, good sober suit beneath a tan, delicately soiled raincoat, fedora hat slightly tilted over the left eye, maroon muffler, and brown leather gloves. With the briefcase under his arm, Farrar looked like what he was, a lawyer, a hard-working paladin, ready to defend you against Uncle Henry's raid on your trusts. As he reached the entry to the department store, Farrar saw once again a thin little fellow who wore gold-rimmed spectacles, hands in the pockets of a blue overcoat, shoulders slumped as from fatigue or sorrow, who had followed him all day. This time he was leaning against the door of a taxi while the driver read a newspaper by the light of a street lamp. The man in the blue overcoat had been with Farrar at every stop, waiting outside at each location, but not at all secretive, as though someone wanted Farrar to know he was being watched. Now who would that be? There were many possibilities for the secret services of Germany, Italy, and the USSR. The civil war in Spain was a spymaster's dream, and attacks were organized against targets everywhere in Europe, politicians of the left, diplomats, intellectuals, journalists, idealists, all much favored prey of the clandestine forces, be they fascist or communist. At embassies, social salons, grand hotels, and nightclubs, the predators worked day and night. As for the man who followed him, Farrar suspected he might be a local communist in service to the NKVD since the USSR, the Republic's crucial, almost its only ally, famously spied on its enemies, its friends, and everybody else. Or could the man be working for Franco's secret police? Farrar was determined not to brood about it. He could think of nothing to do in response, and he was not someone easily intimidated. He dismissed the man's presence with an unvoiced sigh, pulled the massive door open, and entered the store. Barely audible above the din of the shopping crowd, yet another band of carolers was singing joyful and triumphant. Momentarily adrift in an aromatic maze of perfume and cosmetics counters, Farrar searched for the jewelry department. The man in the blue overcoat waited outside. P.J. Delaney, it said on the window. Then below that, bar and grill. The very perfection of what the gossip columnists would call the local saloon. It had been there forever on East 37th Street in Murray Hill, a neighborhood of rooming houses and small hotels, a low rung on the middle class ladder, where office workers, sales clerks, and people who did God only knew what lived in genteel poverty. But their lives were their own. The neighborhood had, for no particular reason, a seductive air of privacy about it. You could do what you liked, and nobody cared. Delaney's, as it was known, was down four steps from the sidewalk. Open the door, and the atmosphere came rolling out at you, decades of spilled beer and cigarette smoke. Christian Farrar sat in a booth by the wall, a stout wooden table, its, edge, its, its edges scarred by cigarette burns, was flanked by benches attached to high backs, the tops handsomely scrolled. He had his New York Times spread out before him, ashtray to one side, whiskey and soda on the other. Farrar tried to read the newspaper, then folded it up and put it back in his briefcase, at least for the moment, he would spare himself the smoke and fume of Europe on fire. He was in Delaney's to meet his lover, Eileen Moore, so turned his thoughts to the pleasures they would share. As he thought of her, his eyes wandered up to the window and the sidewalk outside where, since the bar was below street level, he could see only the lower halves of people walking by. Could he identify Eileen before she entered the bar? In his imagination, he could see her strong legs in black cotton stockings, but she might be wearing something else. Outside, it was still snowing. A little girl paused, then bent over to peer through the window until her mother towed her away. Farrar had a sip of his drink when he put the glass down. There she was. 
Hello, Christiane, she said, hands in the pockets of her wool coat. He stood, his smile radiant, and they embraced, a light public embrace which lingered for the extra second that separates friendship from intimacy. Then he helped her off with her coat, finding ways to touch her as he did so, and hung it on a brass hook fixed to the side of the booth. She sat, slid next to the wall, he settled beside her, she rested a hand on his knee, there were droplets of melted snow in her hair. It's been too long, he said. It has. We'll make up for that, he said. Her hand tightened on his knee. Their eyes met, followed by a pair of knowing smiles, grins almost. She had auburn hair, parted in the middle and falling in wings to her shoulders, easy to brush into place, cheap to maintain, and a pale redhead's complexion with a spray of freckles barely visible across the bridge of her nose. An Irish girl, raised in the Bronx, now in her early thirties, living a Manhattan life. She wouldn't be called pretty, but her face was animated and alive and good to look at. She wore a gray wool sweater that buttoned up the front, little gold earrings, no makeup, French perfume he'd bought her in August, black skirt, and the black cotton stockings with a seam up the back. Seeing you made me forget, she said. I meant to say, buenos noches. Did I get that right? You did, he said. Then, the old greeting. They don't say that these days. By this she was startled. And why not? It would mean you were of the upper classes and someone would arrest you. Now they say salute or salute camarada. You know, comrade. I'm not much of a comrade, she said. I marched back in November and we have a help Spain coin jar at work. That's about as far as I go with the politics. At work meant, he knew, at the public library where she shelved books at night. By day she wrote novels, cheap paperbacks with lurid covers. <laughs> have you eaten, he asked. No, I'm not all that hungry. What's on the blackboard? Chicken a la king, it said, which is pieces of chicken and cream sauce on toast. If the cook is feeling his oats, there might be a pea or two in there. And what king ate this? Her laugh was loud and harsh. You, she said. Let me get you a drink. What have you got there? Whiskey and soda. Rye whiskey in here. Yes, I'll have that. He went to the bar and returned with a drink. Eileen took a pack of Chesterfields from her purse, smacked it twice on the table to firm up the tobacco at the smoker's end, then peeled back the foil. Farrar drew a giton from his pocket and lit both their cigarettes, she raised her glass and said, Salut, comrade, then added, and mud in your eye, and drank off a generous sip. In my eye? He was being droll, which she really liked, and it sounded good in his accent, vaguely foreign, with a British lilt, because he'd learned his English in Paris, where the teachers were British expatriates. Are you still living at the same place, Farrar said? She nodded. The good old Iroquois Hotel, a room and a hot plate, bathroom down the hall. And a bed, he thought. A fond memory, that narrow bed, with a lumpy mattress and iron rails at head and foot. Not much of a bed, but wonderful things happened there. With Eileen Moore, he shared two great passions. They loved to laugh, and they loved sex. The more they excited each other, the more excited they became. Attraction was always mysterious, he believed, he didn't really know what drew her to him, but for himself he knew very well indeed. Yes, he had a fierce appetite for her small curved shape, for her round bottom in motion, but beyond that he was wildly provoked by her redhead's coloring. He believed, down where his desire lived, that redheads had thinner skin, so that a single stroke went a long way. In Farrar's imagination, amid the crowd in the noisy bar, he recalled how, when he first touched her breasts, her chin lifted and her face became taut and concentrated. Stop it, he told himself. It was too soon to leave. He finished his drink and went off to get more. Returning to the table, a drink in either hand, he said, Are you writing a new book? Yes, I am. Fatal Friday did okay, so my editor wanted another. My working title is Death of a Dame. What do you think? Well, I'd read it. 
Ah, go on, she said. I would read it because you wrote it, she snorted. No trace of me on the cover as usual. At Phoenix Press, only men write naughty crime books. That's the rule. Do you mind? A little, maybe. My friend Dawn thinks I should. By Dawn, she meant Dawn Powell, the reigning novelist of Murray Hill. Would you try one with your name on it? She shrugged. I don't know. Maybe someday. I think you will, Eileen, he said, touching her thigh beneath the table. Suddenly she leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. Damn, I'm happy you're here. He took his hand from her thigh and ran his fingers up under the silky hair on the back of her head. Have what you want of that, he said, indicating her glass. He left the rest unsaid. She knew what he wanted. She finished her drink and then, with mischief in her smile and the quick nod and glance toward the door, which meant, let's get out of here, she sped them on their way. Outside, the snow was sticking here and there as the night grew colder, but was no more than a coating on the pavement. As they climbed the steps in front of the bar, she took his arm and then, as he transferred the sax bag to his other hand, he noticed, a little way up the street and on the side opposite Delaney's, a taxi with its lights off, engine thrumming, two white faces in the front seat. What's in the bag, Christian? Presents for you, but you'll have to earn them. Oh, no, she said. Not that. Thank you. A toi. No questions tonight? <laughs> yes. Do you have any women characters who are dashing, strong, brave, intelligent, and more than uh, dime novel writers? And if so, who's your favorite that you ever wrote? Within these very pages, <laughs> there is the woman you describe. It would be very hard for me to pick one of my heroines or one of the women in my books there are many. They do different things. They're different ages. Um, I'm very partial to an 18-year-old Polish uh, code clerk who, in occupied Warsaw, blows up the Gestapo when they enter the building. I like her. I don't know that she has a name. She probably does, but I don't remember it. <laughs> Anybody? Yes, sir. With your remarkable powers of description, uh, this is a process question. How much do you rewrite? Uh, how much contemporaneous research do you do? What time of day do you write? Uh, all of that. Do you find adjectives and adverbs friend, friends or enemies? Yeah. <laughs> I like to say I sit alone in a room and fight the language four hours a day because it will never entirely do what you want it to do. Um, as for research, uh, I like contemporary writing writing of the time, which means, for example, um, when journalists would go from London or New York to, say, Bucharest, they would remain there for three years. At the end of three years, they would return home. They would write a book. It was always called Fire Over Europe. <laughs> it, it never persuaded anybody of anything. But they're very interesting and observant books. Instance, Cy Salzberger, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I go to work. I'm a blue-collar writer, production writer. Uh, I get up uh, 7.30. I'm at work by 8, 8.15. I can work for four hours, and that's about as much as I can do. Uh, and I work at a, IBM, a descendant of the magnificent IBM Selectric, the Lex, the Lex, whatever, Lex, Lex, wheel writer. Lexus, I think, wheel writer. Could you say a bit more about the sources you use? Um, aside from the journalist books, I like um, bi uh, autobiographies that people wrote right after the war, um, some contemporary history. 
I like, uh, I particularly like memoir, self-published memoirs by people who survived the war. Those kinds of books where um, the children say, you know, Mama, you, you, you have to write down your experiences. These books are often self-published and they are invaluable because it is the preservation of experience, it is the preservation of history. I, I use those. I read fiction of the time which bears the psychic energy of those days, of which there was abundant. And, and that's approximately what I do. I do no primary research, no diaries, no, no, nothing like that. It's all, as, it's all as I've described. It's all in books. Yes, sir. Um, you cover a lot of geography in uh, your collected works and always this exquisite sense of place. Um, the Brasserie Einiger. Yes, sir. What gave you the inspiration? What's the, as, as you visit Paris and travel about it, what is the closest to the Brasserie that, uh, that gave you the inspiration? The real, the model for the Brasserie Heininger is a brasserie that was near my house called Beaufanger, Bowfinger, mm -hmm. and right near the Place Bastille. Unfortunately, uh, many years ago, this brasserie was bought by the Brasserie Flow Group, and that was the end of it. However, there is, up on, I believe, the Rue Vieille de Temps, a brasserie that's much more original in feeling called the Brasserie Jenny, and to you I can recommend that. But no Bulgarian maitre d' shot in the ladies' room. <laughs> I'm a liar. <laughs> I'm a novelist. <laughs> Sir. In your books, you've been dealing with the onset of the war, the years before and the early years of the war. And generally, this is a division between fascists, communists, and others. The Spanish Civil War is a bit more complicated in some ways, although it's a testing ground between uh, Hitler and Stalin. It's also got this uh, anti clerical uh, involvement. It's got the role of the Catholic Church. Is that factored into this book at all? Because they were powerful interests in the way we thought about Here's it. as much as I allow myself to say. If you start trying to explain the Spanish Civil War in a novel, you're going to write a very complicated history. What happened was very complicated. I have isolated that down to the fact that the anarchists, when, when Franco had the coup d'etat, the Republican government armed the labor unions. And one of the, some of the labor unions were anarchists in nature. Anarchists meant a lot of criminals. They murdered priests, they murdered nuns, they burned down 50 to 100 churches. What this did was it stopped the United States from helping them because Franklin Roosevelt was elected by Catholic working men and women in American cities, and that's all they needed to hear, so he could do nothing. I, that, there, you know, it's one of those periods of history with too many footnotes. That's all I can say, and I do not allow it, I do not allow that swamp to draw me in. I'm writing a novel. I'm writing a novel for you to read on an airplane. Basta. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I'm wondering about some of the side characters like Polanyi, who's been in many of your books, and I, I've always wondered, what happens to somebody like him? Like, he's been involved in so many of the books. What... He has to end somehow, like, either, you know, passed out in the Heininger or whatever it may be, but what, 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 what's the, what may happen to him? I'm, I've always been fascinated by him. I think he's a he, great character. He will live a long and happy life, Count Janos Polanyi, diplomat spy of the Hungarian embassy in Paris. He is an utter hound, and he and the lead character in this book have a magnificent guy conversation in the middle of this book. Uh, I've always liked him. It's the strangest thing. It's like a little bit a kid playing with toys and making up stories. Sometimes when you create a character, that man or woman steps up and tries to take over the book. I mean, it sounds like I'm crazy, but that's really what happens. 
It comes at the ends of your fingers. You suddenly find yourself incredibly happy to write about this person coming up with good language and exciting writing. Why? This, this individual, this phantom, maybe, has inspired you. Okay? Thank you. Thank I have a million other questions, but I'm not going to bother you with them right now. Uh, you won't bother me. Yes, anybody else? Yes. Uh, I read an interview with you where you said that you only write between 1938 and 1942, more or less, because that's when the outcome of the war was really, when the Nazis were ascendant and who knew what was going to happen. And I thought that was really interesting, and I'd like you to talk more about that. Well, um, World War II comes in two parts, I would say, psychically in two parts, in terms of how characters see things and what goes on. From 1933, the ascension of Hitler, to uh, 39, invasion of Poland, 40, defeat of France, 41, Barbarossa, the attack, initially very successful on the Soviet Union. But in 1942 comes Stalingrad, and at that point, when the Sixth Army surrendered um, at Stalingrad, everybody in Europe suddenly realized this is the end. These people are going to lose. Now they changed. It was no longer a matter of, I'm going to die, so I'm going to fight back and do whatever I can. Now they thought, how do I live to the end of this thing? Very, very different. So I never go beyond 42 because that's a very, very different kind of approach. Anybody? Take a last question. Okay. I'm a Tibetan from India. So I've heard a lot about, uh, you know, the, the sufferings, you know. Uh, even Tibetans had gone through that too, but uh, I have found out new things that kind of pacified me further and, you know, reasoned out a, a little bit in a more enlightened way. Did you uh, find anything during the research uh, as to, you know, new developments, new findings that will pacify the people who are still, you know, has anger and animosity, and if they're waging war again silently, Assuming I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of improvement, but I still see a lot of uh, 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 t tension or scaredness, you know, like they have to be very secretive, very diplomatic, this and that. That's so the world. did you find anything, you know, because now we found out a lot about DNA and I mean, they finally started talking about those. Uh, I bet they knew a lot back then, but they didn't share it, share them to us with us. So did you the, find anything that the, you know, people now start saying, oh, you know, that's what happened. And therefore, I don't. Get mad there are a, that much. there are Thank a you. lot of stories that I believe I basically recover. The only test here is when I talk to friends, when I test some of the things I'm doing on people I know, they will go, "Oh, I didn't know that." I love hearing those words. <laughs> this was a big, complicated pre-war and war over thousands of miles involving millions of people and tens of millions of individual stories, many of them moving. And I am always interested in the fleeting detail in what can be retrieved, in a sense, and uh, again made public. That's, that's the best I know how to answer your question. So we... One more, yeah, yes, sir. Real quick question. Uh, there was a British TV series, The Spies of Warsaw. What did you think about it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny kind of animal, that BBC production. Um, I loved the cinematography. I loved the costumes. I thought it was very well directed. I didn't think it was a great piece of BBC work. They did the best they could. I hold myself to some degree responsible um, because when I watched it, I realized that it, de it never had as a novel the beats, so-called, that a film requires. It's cinematic, and that makes you think, oh, this would make a great movie. But cinematic doesn't necessarily make a great movie. What you need for that is kind of back and forth, up and down plot events. And I really don't write that way. Anyhow, I'm sorry it isn't better. <laughs> but my mom told me what your mom told you. If you don't have something good to say, don't say anything. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I'd be happy to sign books. Thank you. Thank you.